Good morning and happy Easter. We are still in the season of Easter, celebrating the hope that is given to us in the risen Christ. And I'm glad to be with all of you this morning in worship, whether you're joining us over live stream or here in the sanctuary. We know that the spirit of the risen Christ unites us in this time together. Just a few um, announcements as we gather this morning. I would like to invite everyone to take a moment and register your attendance. If you're worshiping online, there's a link you can place in the chat. Um, I'm sorry, in your browser to do that. And here in the sanctuary, we have registration pads at the end of each row. If you'll sign those and pass them down and pay attention to the names of the others sitting on the row with you. And if you don't recognize the name, there's an opportunity to make a new friend today. If you are a college student, I want to invite you to lunch after this service. Our college students gather on Sundays after the late service out in the narthex, the room there at the back, and uh, we'll take you to lunch. Um, it's a free lunch for you and a good chance to have some fellowship and enjoy each other's company. This afternoon at 5 p.m., we'll have our monthly service of Teze worship. It starts at 5 o'clock, and we would welcome you to participate in that service of contemplative prayer, singing, and silence. I wanted to let you know that um, this morning from 8.30 to 12.30 and also next Sunday from 8.30 to 12.30, our gymnasium will be open for us to um, write letters to our state, local, and federal leaders um, advocating for gun reform. Our bishop has put out the call to all United Methodists in our area to do just that, and we're hoping as a denomination in this area to have 5,000 letters going to our leaders calling for greater gun safety in our legal system. There's also a table down there for, um, from our creation care team, a letter we'd like to send um, calling for greater care of our environment. And then also some representatives from our ministry with NOAA, which stands for Nashvilleians Organized for Action and Hope. They want to take a survey and have some listening opportunities to see what issues in our city are most important to you. So there's a lot going, down, uh, going on down in the gymnasium. It'll also be happening next week, and we hope you'll participate. I wanted to let you know that as part of our 150th celebration, our own Mac Perkle is working with his video company to produce a few videos for, to help us tell our story as a congregation about God's unconditional love for all people. And this morning, we have with us Britt Simmons, who works for Creative Communications. There's Britt. And he's going to be taking some photographs of worship today, very discreetly. And um, that will be part of the video production when we get to the point of actual final production of the video, we will let you know if you are in any of these pictures so you can say yes or no, I don't want to be in that in case um, we want to re respect everyone's privacy. But the purpose of this effort is to share the story of God's unconditional love uh, in our community. Finally, I want to invite Jane Shown to come and share an announcement with us. Jane is the chair of our Staff Parish Relations Committee. Good morning. As you know, in the United Methodist Church, our bishop and cabinet work together every year to discern where clergy are being called to serve. As the chair of our staff parish committee, I wanted to let you know that our beloved Aaron Racine has been called up to serve in a new appointment starting later this summer. The bishop has asked that we not yet announce where she will be serving because he is making a larger announcement in his blog set to go out this afternoon. After the bishop's announcement, Erin will be able to share in more detail about her next steps and we will have lots of opportunities in the days ahead to pray for her and to celebrate her ministry among us. The bishop and cabinet have been working very hard in this very turbulent time in the United Methodist Church. They have projected someone to come onto our clergy staff, and we hope to be able to share that information next Sunday. In the meantime, say a prayer of thanks for all that Erin means to us, and let's continue to pray for her as she enters a new season of ministry. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership. Every year when there's a new staff parish chair, I want to say, there won't be any changes, but that's part of being a United Methodist is responding to the call, and the bishop has called Aaron into a new season of ministry. So we'll have opportunities in the weeks and months ahead to celebrate her and to show her how much we love her as she prepares to step out. She is currently showing some um, 
visitors around the building. So she's doing her job right now, uh, but I know she'll appreciate hearing from you in the days and weeks ahead. Let us now open our hearts and minds to celebrate God's presence among us and to worship the God of all generations.
God, you call us to trust in you. Lord, help us to follow Trusting that God's love for us is unconditional and God's mercy is everlasting, let us make our confession with the confidence of children of God. Merciful God, you have made your presence and love known among us throughout the generations. You have empowered us to serve you and serve others in your name. But too often we forget. We forget what you have done for us. We forget the call you place on our lives. We turn away from people who are suffering. We choose comfort and easy answers. Forgive us, God. Help us to remember. Help us to be faithful to you every day. Help us to take the next right step. And now, O oh God, we offer you our individual confessions in silence. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And now as a forgiven and reconciled people, let us exchange signs of reconciliation and love. The peace of Christ be with you.
Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and the word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. A lesson from the Old Testament, Joshua 4, verses 1 through 7, and Judges 2, 6 through 10. When the entire nation had finished crossing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Select twelve men from the people, one from each tribe, and command them. Take twelve stones from here, out of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood. Carry them over with you and lay them down in the place where you camp tonight. Then Joshua summoned the twelve men from the Israelites, whom he had appointed, one from each tribe. Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan, and each of you take up a stone on his shoulder, one for each of the tribes of the Israelites, so that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off in front of the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the Israelites a memorial forever. When Joshua dismissed the people, the Israelites all went to their own inheritances to take possession of the land. The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. So they buried him within the bounds of his inheritance in timnath in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. Moreover, the whole generation was gathered unto their ancestors, and another generation grew up after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
grown-ups to be seated. And if there are any children in the room who want to come join me up here for a minute, I'd love to be with you. And if you're worshiping from home, just get a little closer to your screens. I have some things to show you this morning. Good morning, good morning. Thank you, Whit, and happy Easter, because we still celebrate Easter today. Come on down. I'm so glad to see you all this morning. All right, welcome. I have some special stones that I want to share with you today. This is a kind of a big stone that I was given by a group of people that I had Bible study with. For years and years and years, we met every Friday morning for Bible study. And the time came for me to move, so I had to leave them. But they gave me this stone, and it has the word love painted on it. Love binds us together. And so I keep this stone in my office. And every time I look at it, I think about all the ways that I felt God through the people in that Bible study. And I think about them. Then I have this other stone that also has the word love on it. And I got this when I went to a retreat, which means I went with a group of people up on a mountain and we spent the whole weekend together praying and sharing and talking. And I keep this in my office. And every time I look at it, I think about how I experience God up on that mountaintop with all of those people. And then this is like the coolest rock I've ever seen. It's got pink and gray and black and white all mixed in together. I picked up this rock off of a beach on an island called Iona. Iona is an island off the coast of Scotland and it's really far away. And to get there, I had to take a plane and then a train and then a bus and then a boat and then another bus. So it was really far away. But it's a really beautiful and special place. And on that island, there's a beach with all different kinds of rocks that look like this. And I was with a group, and they told us to take one of these rocks and remember how we felt God in that beautiful place together. So I keep this rock at home next to where I sit and pray to remember how close I felt to God on that day. It's really important for us to remember how God loves us and to remember different times that we felt God and different ways that we experience God. And sometimes it helps to have things like this to look at and remind us. The Bible story today is about a time when the people of God wanted to remember what God had done for them. And so they put a bunch of rocks in a river to remind them and they said, when our children are born and when our grandchildren are born, we're going to take them to see these rocks and tell the story so we can all remember how much God means to us. Let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you so much for the different ways we get to experience you. We thank you for those special times and places when we feel extra close to you. We hope that you'll help us to tell those stories and to always remember that you're always with us and we're never alone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you all so much. Three, four, and five-year-olds can go with Pastor Stacy and Pastor Maggie to Children's Church. That's beautiful. Is that your Easter bunny? <laughs> oh, Easter. Easter was glorious last week. I have been energized by the spirit that I experienced in Easter worship last week. And it seems a little bit of a challenge to, to come from Easter into the book of Joshua. <laughs> for those of you who may be worshiping with us for the first time today or, or maybe aren't aware of the journey that our congregation is on this year, this is our 150th year. And as part of that, we are reading the Bible together. We're making our way through the scriptures. We started in January with the book of Genesis. We made it all the way through the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And then we took a break during Lent to be in the Gospel of John to prepare ourselves for Easter. But now we pick the story back up with one of the most difficult books in the Bible, in my opinion. So where we left off at the end of Deuteronomy... 
God had chosen the descendants of Abraham to be a special people for God. They had been called out as a particular people. They had, in the book of Exodus, been experiencing 400 years of enslavement in Egypt. And then God liberated them and through Moses led them into freedom and led them toward the promised land. And much of the first five books of the Bible take place on that journey to the promised land. If you know the story, if you remember it, they got to the promised land, but they gave in to fear. And they weren't ready to enter the promised land. So God said, you need to wait. And so for 40 more years, they wandered in the wilderness. At the end of the book of Deuteronomy, Moses dies. He never gets the opportunity to enter the promised land, but he gives his final words to them and anoints Joshua as his successor. And so the book of Joshua opens, and now is the moment when the people of Israel are going to cross over that Jordan River and enter the promised land. And this text that Claudia read for us tells that story of the crossing of the Jordan and how God instructed the people to mark that moment, remember this moment. Each tribe was told to take a stone and place it in the middle of the Jordan at the place where the waters had parted to be sure and remember that moment and to tell the story to their children and their children's children so they would always know what God had done for them and how God was with them. And it's a beautiful scene, a beautiful story with great metaphor and imagery to work with. And then there's the rest of the book of Joshua. Now some of you, I know, have been reading along in the scriptures with the the plan that we set out at the beginning of the year. And and so you've read the rest of the book of Joshua. And I'm not going to lie, it's troubling and difficult to read. Because it is the story of, of the Israelites' conquest of the promised land. And the way the story is told, it is, it is violent and it is, uh, it's like a blitzkrieg of the land. And it's hard for us to understand how this could be, have been God's will. How, how could this story be the way of God? The God of Easter, the God of the risen Christ who taught love your enemies. The Christ who opened the grace of God to all peoples everywhere. It's hard for us to make sense of that. And so it's tempting just to say, let's not deal with Joshua. But I think there's an invitation for us to pick up the book of Joshua and and see how it can help us understand history, to help us ask questions about how we tell our stories and how we pass down our history from one generation to the next. There are many scholars who will tell us that the book of Joshua was actually written hundreds of years later at a time when Israel was weak and under siege and the leaders at that time were wanting to unite all the tribes of Israel and to remind them of their strength. And so perhaps the book of Joshua is a bit of revisionist history, a little bit of a heroic history. Look how strong we were. Look how much God was on our side. And we can look at other texts in the Bible itself for other accounts. Even in the book of Judges, we see that the settling into the land was perhaps a lot more gradual and less complete than it seems to be in the book of Joshua. That's one of the beauties of the scriptures, is we have multiple stories and multiple voices telling the story. We have four different gospels, and they don't all agree on everything, but we can take each one and hear its witness to the truth of Jesus. We have two creation stories. We have the books of Kings and the books of Chronicles that tell the same events but in different ways. And so even this account in Joshua is told perhaps in different ways. And then as modern Christians, we have the science of archaeology that can tell us some things. There's a lot we don't know, but there's some evidence to suggest it maybe didn't happen in this sort of blitzkrieg kind of way. And so perhaps our calling is to to receive the stories as they're told to us, to collect them, and to do all we can to hear all of them and put all of them together, and to trust that the God of Easter, the God of love, the God of grace, will reveal things to us about who God is and who 
we are. And there's no need to be ashamed or afraid of all of these different stories, but to open ourselves to hear them. And maybe that's an invitation to to how we look at history, to welcome all of the stories and all of the voices and all of the narratives to broaden and enrich our understanding of who we have been, who we are, and above all, who God is in the midst of history. I have my own experience of my family's history that I've shared with you before in some situations. Many of you know that I have um, a large family on my mother's side. We have a family reunion every year. It's a camp meeting. It's been going on for nearly 200 years, and I'm generation G, so I'm in the seventh generation. And we have, this is volume three of the Tailors of Tabernacle. And this is part of our family history, and it's made up of of journals and diaries and records and pictures. And every year when we gather as a family, my cousin Joe Thornton will, will pick some things to read. So we hear the voices of our ancestors who were some of the earliest Methodists in this area and hear of, of their stories and their faith. And this is a story that I value and in part tells me where I've come from and how God has been at work in my own family tree. And there's another book. This book is called The Legacy of Tamar. And it's written by a woman who was descended from a woman named Tamar, who was enslaved by my ancestor, John A. Taylor. And it tells of Tamar's descendants and their experiences in West Tennessee and their own journeys of faith. And and there are ancestors from this story that appear in this book and vice versa. And these are both parts of the story. And I feel so much more enriched by knowing the fuller story, by hearing all of these stories. And so they're part of my monument of stones. And I'm excited and looking forward to collecting even more stories from history. We have this year our 150th anniversary as a church, and we are recounting our history as a church. About a month ago, we had a supper and storytelling event up in the theater, and different people from the congregation told stories that, of Sunday school teachers they remembered or experiences of God they had here in this congregation. And it was a beautiful evening, and it was um, energizing and encouraging to hear how God has been at work in and through this congregation for 150 years. And there are also other stories. If we go to our cornerstone, or even on the facade of the church, it says, founded 1873 M.E. South, Methodist Episcopal Church South. And that was a denomination that that pulled out of the Methodist Episcopal Church because they wanted as church members and clergy to continue participating in the institution of slavery. And so the church split in the 19th century over this tragic moment in our nation's history. That's part of our story. And it's an important part to tell and to know and to recount There are some stories that are painful to remember. And there's part of us, a temptation to just not tell those stories. We don't want to be made uncomfortable. And there's a real movement in our world right now to tamp down some of those stories because they are painful. But the purpose of telling the stories is not shame and guilt, but change. And to make sure that we don't go in that direction again. These Israelites were called to bring their stones into the river, to acknowledge that God had been with them. And that's what all of our stories are meant to be about. Not to make us look good or not to make us look bad, but to see the fullness of God's presence with us, a God of past, present, and future, who can work through our messiness and call us forward into a better future. Many years ago, I got to travel in Germany. I had spent a year teaching in France, and after that year was over, I got the Eurail Pass, and I was traveling everywhere. 
And I got to see the castles and the, the monasteries and the cathedrals of Germany and all of the beauty of that rich history. And also, I went to see Buchenwald, one of the Nazi concentration camps where hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Jews were exterminated. That's all part of the history and the story. And thank God that there were people who preserved that space so that you could go and walk through it and remember. And over the door, as you enter, say the words in German, French, English, Spanish, never again. And that is our hope. That as we tell these stories and name these painful moments in our histories that we can remember. The Israelites didn't remember. Did you catch it? The last sentence of what Claudia read for us in the book of Judges. Joshua had died. All the generation of elders that had entered into the promised land with him had died. And there arose a new generation that did not remember. And so the book of Judges is about how over and over again they made the same mistakes. They started worshiping other gods. They got attacked by armies from other places. God raised a warrior leader to save them. They were rescued. They worshiped God. They had faith. And then they forgot. And it happened again and again. I'm grateful that these stories have been handed down to us. Because never at any time in all of scriptures do the people of God get it exactly right. But they remind us that we are on a journey. And one of the most important things we can do is to tell our stories with honesty and faithfulness. Knowing and trusting that all of our stories collected and piled up are a monument to God's faithfulness. May it be so today and tomorrow and always. One of the ways that we remember and tell our story is by professing our creeds. If you will rise in body or in spirit and turn to page 883 in your hymnal, we will profess together the statement of faith from the United Church of Canada. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus the word made flesh to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we come to a time of prayer, I invite you to lift up both your silent and spoken prayers. If you're in the congregation in person, we would like to offer a gray card that's in the pew rack in front of you. You can fill out that card with your prayer request and note if you'd like for it to be kept confidential or shared with the congregation and put that gray card into the offering plates in a few moments. If you're worshiping with us online, we invite you to click the contact us link and share your prayer requests with us. The pastoral team will be praying for you throughout the week. We have three roses on the altar this morning to celebrate the birth of three children. We celebrate the birth of Sterling L. Meadows to Taylor and Eric Meadows. She was born on December 11th, 2022, and she's welcomed by her sibling Preston and Eli Meadows. We also rejoice in the birth of Lucas James Banker. 
who was born March the 27th in Court Moderna, California, to Marta and James Banker, Jr. He is welcomed also by his big brother, Nico Banker, and grandparents, Jean Ann and Barry Banker. We also rejoice with the birth of Mary Irwin Wynn Corcoran, who was born April the 4th to Tom and Francie Corcoran. She is welcomed also by her aunt and uncle, Carolyn and Ben Eisman, and grandparents, Irwin and Jeff Fisher. Our deepest sympathies and love and peace are extended to two families this morning. We pray with Becky, Steve, and Riley Verner and their family, who are mourning the death of Becky's mother, Linda Coker Miller, who died on March the 31st in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Services were held there on April the 2nd. And we pray with Charles Harding and his family, who are mourning the death of his mother, Onita Harding, who passed away on April the 4th in White House, Tennessee. There will be a private service and internment. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O resurrected, risen Lord, we praise you this Easter season. With glad and grateful hearts, we participate in your abundant life. Today, we have the opportunity to write letters and have conversations about how our faith informs our daily life. We pray that our advocacy work will be a reflection of your compassion and peace. Give the leaders of our city, state, and nation strength, wisdom, and clarity for the thriving of all people. We are grateful, God, to advocate for creation. We praise you for the sand and the stars, for the oceans and the mountains. Thank you, God, for putting us in this world so majestic and giving us the tools and the choices to care for the earth and her resources. We are grateful, too, for the conference-wide gun reform initiative Help us to beat our swords into plowshares. Help us to put down our swords collectively and individually. And may our actions for a more peaceable world for our neighbors, children, friends, and those whom we disagree be a prayer of its own. Today we come to you in a time of transition in this liminal space where we welcome Shannon Baxter and his family. May you bless his work among us. We give you thanks for Erin Racine and her family. We are so grateful for her and her decade of pastoral leadership and ministry in this church. We are so grateful. And now we pray together the prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now gather our gifts together and offer them to God in gratitude and praise.
go from this place to continue the journey, to tell our stories with our own unique experiences of God and our own voices. The good news is we are not who we once were, and we are not yet who we will be. So let us go trusting in God to continue the transformation. Amen.